good evening everyone uh, i'm so glad all of you could join and i'm assuming that most of uh, the others who have signed up will also be joining in shortly but since it's 6:30 already uh, we will go ahead and begin the presentation so i really miss meeting you guys in person and uh, interacting with you over a cup of tea uh, but this is the way things are going to be for a while i guess uh, so just thought maybe we could you know create a interactive session on zoom rather than uh, having to do it in person and i think we actually missed a lot of fof uh, sessions as well we have been trying to upload stuff whenever we get time but i think the face to face interaction and the fun we used to have at the venue uh, that cannot be replicated very easily so i hope that we can do this more often and we can uh, keep interacting on zoom meanwhile uh, till we go back to the venue so today's topic is a little bit uh, of a play on words so you know as a service has become like a rage in terms of whatever you see uh, you can create as a service and you know, why not use financial data and uh, create the use the moniker as a service to that as well uh, although i don't like the way the acronym sounds uh, for us i don't like that that's why i would just keep saying uh, data as a service if at all it's required in the future and the genesis of this presentation actually uh, came when i saw the congressional hearing uh, although not very interesting thing to watch Uh, especially the hours at which the, which it plays uh, in the US it was three time so it's night here but i i was curious so because we own most of the companies uh, whose ceos were invited to testify in terms in front of the congressional hearing uh, these are the big tech guys and we know very well that big tech relies a lot on data and data is like something they uh, really think is uh, i would say the raw material for their business uh, to some extent so for example google and facebook advertising business use uses data to target ads uh, to users which are always relevant and are very precise i mean it shows up exactly when you want to do that activity that's a interesting thing uh, in terms of data usage apple has been on the other side they have been saying that they want privacy uh, and they focus more on user privacy and data has been something that they want to keep it uh, within apple's confine rather than using it for targeting advertisements and amazon also has been using user data to improve the service the e-commerce experience and now even advertising uh, as they are growing that business as well so these these companies clearly uh, revere and uh, find data to be extremely important and that is something i was intrigued that you know uh, every time we say data is the new and you no know, people insert whatever precious resource that they find somebody calls it gold somebody calls it oil and somebody something else uh, so data is, is clearly a very precious resource uh, in context of uh, the modern digital world that we live in but which other sector like the tech sector is dominating us uh, i think uh, every single thing we touch nowadays uh, has some tech effect on it uh, it's very unlikely that tech has not affected so for example even if you're using a fountain pen to write on a piece of paper uh, that paper would have been processed in the way where technology was used to some extent in order to sell the paper to you or even the fountain pen would have appeared on instagram you would have bought it over there so yeah i mean which other sector does have this kind of dominance in our lives where it touches almost every aspect of what we what things we do and uh, the answer is finance right i mean uh, most of the people who are fof members are avid capital market investors as well as uh, capital market followers they have probably been longer in the capital markets and uh, my entire experience but uh, some of these uh, businesses for us are actually routine day to day businesses where we know that these are yeah these are existing platforms we use to transact or buy and sell shares or even get data about businesses but do they have the capacity to be called as a bank of finance because we clearly know that in finance there are several large entities large firms uh, which have global expanse but who are the fang of finance is something i always kept wondering so the obvious thing that comes to our mind is the asset managers because uh, we know that passive investing is growing quite steadily over the past couple of decades we are seeing asset managers who have trillions of dollars of uh, assets under management which otherwise i don't think we ever had that kind of size of uh, aum in many companies so those things really come to our mind because you know when you see the number trillion it's actually something where when we felt 100 billion 10 years back that's a very large number maybe we will get used to trillions and we'll probably start thinking of 10 trillion as a large number uh, in the future hopefully but asset managers is a you know nearest contender in terms of uh, a large financial entity which could be uh, you know as a parallel to the fang of finance 
or maybe it is a bank you know we have got, we have seen in the past like 10 years ago we had banks who were called too big to fail and in fact after the policy changes and regulations these banks have become really important structural pillars of the financial ecosystem all over the world i mean finance wouldn't exist if banks don't exist right so the oldest uh, industry of them all uh, money lending is actually an important aspect of finance but uh, lately if you see banks and asset managers although their expanse and reach is uh, quite large there might be other entities who might also be important in the overall scheme of things and these can be intermediaries so there are several intermediaries uh, we know that uh, we use intermediaries for trading on the financial markets we use intermediaries to get information about ratings or analysis regarding certain securities and we also use intermediaries who aggregate data to us uh, to some extent and we end up paying fees in one way or the other we can pay, pay a brokerage commission we can pay a fixed fee for accessing reports we can also use a subscription in order to access data from financial databases and this is the essential nexus of the trade rate and and aggregate where the combined effect is the importance of financial data that we are allowed to access and we are able to use it for decision making in investing or our financial activities so today's presentation is going to focus on this data which is financial data as a service where all these three entities uh, are contributing to something that we do or feel very fundamental to our existence in capital markets otherwise the capital market users will not be uh, as savvy as they were today so let's uh, dive in to see what actually is financial data uh, and while i'm speaking you can uh, also access the q and a feature in zoom and keep piling up the questions that you have and uh, by the end of the presentation uh, i will have raj moderate these questions and after the session is over we can also have a free willing chat uh, with all the attendees so keep uh, putting up your questions uh, in the q and a section so financial data is very easy i mean we know all these things uh, at the back of our hands as capital market practitioners we practitioners so we know uh, article data which is the real time stock price or real time market data uh, is a very important financial data that we look at because that actually decides our buy and sell transaction at that particular moment also transaction data from the past is also relevant uh, when we are using algorithms when we are using uh, back testing models we need historical data we need price volume data to see how the price action had been and it is across asset classes so you have equities uh, transaction data fixed income currencies commodities and even interest rates and derivatives on top of this so you have all derivatives also linked to all these securities which give us a historical context of the trading or activity in any ticker that we want to see or we are interested in uh, third and most important which is nowadays becoming uh, very very relevant is the indices information and we'll talk about this in detail a little later Uh, which also provides uh, some some form of portfolio analytics uh, if you are a index investor or etf investor or tools which are allow you to manage your portfolio better uh, so your broker if they are tech savvy enough they might provide you these tools to do automatic rebalancing or you can set rules in your portfolio saying that if this stock hits a particular level automatically execute the order of course by keeping enough margin with the broker so these kind of tools are also available now uh, thanks to technology that we are using other important financial data is the credit ratings of businesses uh, which are useful to banks or even uh, individual investors who are investing in debt uh, corporate debt or any other kind of uh, debt fixed income uh, instrument and credit scores are also useful for lenders who are lending to individuals uh, essentially credit rating is a credit score for an for an entire entity an organization whereas a credit score is like a credit score for an individual if you are lending to a person and it's the backbone of the entire uh, lending business right i mean if you uh, can justify a rating about a particular person or entity you can then lend to them at the rates that you desire if they are in the qualifying range uh, and the most important data uh, financial data is the uh, regulatory filings of companies operating metrics essentially past financial data which the company has reported uh, either to uh, the mca equivalent all over the world or even to the stock exchanges so it can be in the form of uh, all the three financial statements key financial statements the ratios of these companies and everything is given to us in a clean tabulated format in an ex in excel exported format which you can then manipulate and you know calculate and do your calculations on top of that so this is something that we have been using as analysts and investors uh, i think the, from the first day we start uh, in the capital markets 
and nowadays these data sources are also available for free you have several websites we'll talk about a few names later but there are several websites we actually give access to users to all the data of companies going back 10 years 15 years depending on what service you are using and that's quite revolutionary the, that kind of democratization did not exist 5 uh, years ago uh, and it is a recent past 5 years but still did not exist at that scale as it is available right now uh then we have sectoral data where uh, sort of market level data or top down data of uh, country specific information or supply chain data where companies may or may not be listed uh, but their uh, individual transactions that happen through the system might be captured by some regulatory authority or might be captured by a government entity and those can be captured in a systematized database and structured form can be sold to a user and lastly we have uh, obviously news and social media which also have the ability to impact uh, price volatility and movement in uh, securities that we are tracking and uh, nowadays it is being used in variety of ways uh, with ai and artificial intelligence and analytics to figure out sentiments of what people were actually trying to say what is the zeitgeist what is the noise in the market saying about a certain thing trying to get the emotional pulse of what people are talking about a specific security or an idea so we, this is a variety of financial data which we are uh, used to seeing on a day to day basis as market pra- participants i think uh, so this is a slide i picked up from uh, london stock exchange groups uh, acquisition of refinitiv when they announced it they actually laid out this entire presentation in one single uh, image and i was impressed by the way it co- covers the entire topic i mean if i just had this slide i could just talk about the entire topic to you guys uh, so essentially london stock exchange is one of the oldest stock exchange groups in the world and uh, they basically called them sort of trading values you know where stock exchange activity happens trading activity happens it can be commodity fixed income all sorts of asset classes so they are trying to combine uh, the trading venue which creates proprietary multi asset data which you can see in the top with refinitiv's ability for data and analytics to enable decision making and manage workflows for uh, people who are using these services now uh, clearly we know that exchange's role is not that exchange's role is basically to just be a, uh, a transaction venue people can come there and transact and they just need to facilitate that uh, at whatever volume and transaction efficacy that is required but nowadays exchanges are becoming very bold and they are trying to get into areas where users will uh, essentially use them for other activities as well which generates a additional stream of revenue for them at the same time solidifies some of their dominance in the activities they are operating and we'll see how so clearly the trifecta of trade rate and aggregate and this is something which i created this is not this is not necessarily original but i just wanted to create a visual image for all of us to remember that these three aspects do control a lot of our financial analysis so let's take a look at the data users and this is something uh, which includes us as well who are in the audience and me and my colleagues and everyone so clearly banks and asset managers we know they have access to all this financial data that we saw just now and they use it for decision making Uh, clearly devising investment strategies uh, to basically say go or no go for a specific decision of either lending money or investing in a business or tracking companies on sectors uh, all over the play, all over the world clearly sell side research also is a important source where uh, so important user data user which actually make sure that uh, their information analysis is also available to the buy side or the asset management industry uh Uh, there is something called as mifid 2 it is a regulation that has come up in the eu and mifid 2 has essentially done a very interesting thing i don't know if it's uh, good or bad in the long run but what they have said is you need to separate uh, execution and research services from your uh, brokerage uh, activity so you do run a single brokerage activity at the same time you can be an independent analyst and you can sell it uh, for a fee to other people so there is a new crop of uh, entities and firms which have come up uh, because of this regulation especially in the eu and also now starting to come up in the us uh, area as well but this this regulation has not caught on all over the world but yet independent research analysts do exist even now even without regulation they have been existing but now that it's a regulatory requirement in some cases people have started up official firms and scaled them up uh, and they are also data users same amount of data that we are using they will be using to do their independent research of course investment bankers will require to you know advise people on 
um, M&A activity to make sure IPO, uh, create an IPO market for people, uh, be merchant bankers for companies who are first time coming to the market or even direct listing in the equity markets. So they will also need this information to come up with some sort of a price discovery if their clients require so. Uh, governments is a very interesting uh, data user where right from the local government can be a municipality level government all the way to uh, the state government or the, even the central government. They will be uh, data users. Uh, just one second, I think somebody has asked a question. Okay. I think please pile up the questions uh, as and when you can. Uh, and if uh, Raj and Rajiv can see something which I am missing or maybe I'm disconnected, you can let me know. All right. So governments uh, are using data to make decisions about uh, based on macro environment, they can come up with solutions and decision making can be done based on the same data that we are using. Uh, again, corporates is a very interesting category where strategic decisions can be made based on data that they are collecting. And not all sources of data that we know as public investors will be available to us, uh, but corporates will have a different set of data tools, which they might also be using their own network to cultivate their internal databases. So corporates are another interesting category, which uh, collect data. Treasury departments might be requiring data uh, for selecting the securities to invest for short term or long term or whatever financial needs that they might have, essentially managing the money within an entity or in, in any uh, corporate entity. Uh, another crop of investors or market participants or data users are wealth management advisory firms, which is essentially can create portfolios for you, can manage portfolios for you, can even advise you with your existing portfolios, can come up with solutions for you, which otherwise you may not have been able to do on your own because you're not financially savvy enough. And lastly, individual investors, uh, retail investors, who also have access to the same information that most people have, uh, which was not the case uh, a decade back. Now it's become a little bit more democratized where a lot of uh, granular details are available and uh, from the least sophisticated to the most sophisticated user can actually make use of data in their own way to come across their investment decision making. I think this is an amazing set of users where uh, I, I have, in, my, in my personal career, I have not seen so much data access available. Uh, and I think some people who are older might also reminisce the times when you need to, you need to go to a physical place to get the annual report. Uh, or even go to a, a newspaper shop or Raddiwala and you know, collect the used annual reports from there and then read them. So from that, from those days to now being bombarded by information and now having more relevant structured financial information available to everyone is an amazing leap of progress, I would say. But before that, I would just like to address the size of this market, right? I mean, one thing is to know that intermediaries matter a lot but really how big they can be in terms of revenue potential. So I just went back to the list of uh, what sort of financial data is available and data providers uh, rank in various categories. Like you have exchanges, you have rating agencies, you have payment processors, you have index providers, you have data aggregators. And if you combine all these entities, uh, the annual run rate of revenue was staggering number. So depending on how you count, which currency you count in, I found it to be 110 to $120 billion of annual revenue run rate. Uh, if you remove payment processing companies from this, which is Visa, MasterCard, that will be somewhere close to 60 to $70 billion. Uh, but essentially you have a transaction model as well as a subscription-based model, uh, which generates a total revenue of $120 billion per year. And I think it's a phenomenally large number to really, you know, it's a very large industry, uh, something that was not this big, just I think a decade back or even five years back and has become very large in terms of its importance and dominance in our lives in financial markets. Also, before any questions come about profitability performance, uh, I just want to put this slide in front so that everybody is aware that the lowest ROC I saw in all these companies was close to 20%. The lowest net profit margin I saw was 15%. Uh, and capital efficiency was uh, varied depending on which geography the company works in, what sort of corporate strategy they have in terms of m &A or giving money back. But most of them were very capital efficient. You clearly see the lowest ROC is 20%. All of them are really capital efficient. And also you might be surprised to find some companies which have a negative book value. Now, usually when we look at negative book value, we always wonder that the company's losses over the years would have been so large that the book value actually has been eroded completely. But in this case, it's totally different. 
it's because the companies have bought back most of the equity and the book value has been paid out to shareholders and the company is actually capitalized it's just running on cash flows and uh, it's an amazing place to be in it's essentially infinite roe if you think about it uh, so yeah don't worry about the negative net worth you might see it, these companies may not make in your roe filter that's why I use the roc to make sure that they come in your filters but phenomenal businesses performance is off the charts some companies are at fang level uh, operating margins and cash flow generation and i find it that's the reason i call these fangs of finance because uh, these kind of characteristics are not very easily seen in financial services companies so let's take a look at the first part of the uh, trio of data providers we'll go with the trade and execution bit so essentially exchanges are the plumbers of the world of financial markets right i mean they are not just the plumbers i would say they are also uh, a pumping station because they really uh, know how to pump in the liquidity in the market as well uh, essentially because they have become important infrastructure providers uh, of financial markets so you might have uh, so i'll show the names of companies which are the top 5 6 companies in the world but these are essential technology providers as well as uh, providing the rules for running the clearing houses as well so if you can control that you can essentially control the flow the intensity of the flow you can turn the tap slow you can turn the tap fast you can essentially control liquidity across the world and some of these companies are the pumping stations as well as the pipes across the entire global ecosystem of financial markets or capital markets so i think this analogy when i saw these the saw the financial statements of these companies and the way they were linked all over the world we just made this analogy clear to me that yeah these are this is the plumbing behind the wall we don't see it every day but this is essentially the concealed plumbing that we deal with every day so don't try to read this chart this is a little deliberately cramped just to provide a lot of context to you in just one single slide now what they are trying to show is the num on the bottom you can see these squiggly names written uh, and these are all the exchanges all over the world and uh, the chart represents data from the 1990s uh, sorry 1980s till the latest year 2020 now what we can clearly see is the pattern of consolidation and this has happened before in the past as well where one or two entities were very large the concentration of trade data came through them at the same time over a period of time the asset managers and the banks became very powerful in between and these companies were fragmented they are essentially member run uh, entities right i mean brokers uh, who were members of the exchanges they would come together and trade they became corporatized at some point in time and they decided to consolidate their activities wherever they could now this happened with acquisitions this happened by default this happened because of antitrust uh, regulations where companies had to sell something to some other exchanges and then that became dominant so a lot of m and a activity over the past 40 years has led to this kind of a structure but on top you can see just six names actually dominating the uh, entire global ecosystem of stock exchanges and these are actually the holding companies who provide uh, not only the exchanges the indices uh, and lot of technology behind it but also provide the rules for the clearing corporations to operate in so they can dictate how much margin somebody has to keep for securities they can dictate a lot of things uh, which affect the liquidity or flow of securities so essentially you have seen a lot um, tremendous consolidation which also i mean i wouldn't say ironically but also looks like a little bit like pipes going towards a single source so it's very really interesting to see so many companies uh, converging into a few names and this has happened right under our noses in the past 40 years this is not something uh, i mean antitrust authorities have been looking at these but some of these combinations are not very obvious when you try and dream about them if you try and visualize a business looking like certain kind of a business over the past next 5 to 6 years you wouldn't be able to visualize what combinations are possible because there is so many uh, permutations and combinations for creating mna in this industry and also regulators are not are very very afraid to give so much power to one single exchange or one single entity but that has not stopped them to grow globally that has not stopped them to buy stakes in global exchanges or provide technology to global exchanges and make sure that uh, emerging markets as well enjoy the same kind of trading efficiency that most of the developed world enjoys at the same time they also allow creation of different securities which uh, emerging market uh, regulators may not be aware of about the risks and parameters they can provide data to them that this is how the risk profiles of securities move and uh, regulators can then make a wiser choice to include those securities so a lot of derivative contracts so for example famously we don't have a lot of agri commodity contracts uh, in derivatives 
uh, you don't have counterparties to take the size of some of the people who want to hedge. So some of the data points can come from developed markets, which will help us to grow our ecosystem as well in India. Power exchange, another interesting category where uh, we don't have derivative contracts in power uh, to the scale as which they have in, in the European Union or even the US. So some of these trends eventually will come to India, but they need infrastructure. They need the kind of uh, data for risk management, which can be provided by all these companies globally. So fascinating overview. I, I when I saw this slide, I said this has to go into this presentation, and uh, to show that it's a phenomenal consolidation over the past 40 years. The Economist, I think, last month uh, had a nice article about the exchange businesses, and uh, some of the numbers are staggering. I mean, until you put something in a chart and just map them across uh, and compare them to their competitors, you just don't get the scale and size of the uh, businesses, right? And the moment I saw this graph, it forced me to go back to the annual reports, forced me to read about how the businesses have grown in the past 15, 20 years, because many of them have a long listing history as well. So not all of them will be listed, uh, but those who are listed for a long time, they have a good listing history, disclosure history. You can read the annual reports, see how the business uh, uh, segments have also evolved. And this is this is very staggering that uh, the market caps in the past 10 years have gone completely berserk for most of these companies. So what I liked, uh, when I read the annual reports was to really see the scale of these companies, the penetration in different markets and geographies that they have, and some combination we cannot even imagine. Uh, and also the market value of these companies uh, has gone up quite dramatically. So some of the trends are obvious. So one trend is essentially, like I mentioned earlier, uh, people were not, these are global entities. They were concentrated in their regional geographies, these were regional exchanges. And uh, they may had they may have a, a outpost somewhere in different part of the world to facilitate investors from those parts to invest uh, in the native markets that they operated in, and they had some local dominance that was for sure. So even in India, we had several regional exchanges which could have dominated uh, until a national stock exchange came up and a uh, lot of those market shares fizzled out, and one party became very important. So even then, even these large large exchanges did have their global presence. And this is somewhere in, uh, I think about 18 years ago. Uh, so top 20 exchanges were networked in this particular manner. But the moment you overlap, uh, say 2018 data, you would realize the connectivity and the size of these companies uh, in terms of the organization strength, in terms of the business combinations that they have done through m &A or even through organic scaling in those countries. These became denser networks. They added more dots, they added more, more ability to transact between nations and essentially became far uh, greater networked entities. And these are very simple businesses. These are actually double-sided networks. You just bring two people together and make sure the trade happens. Uh, and then uh, based on some of the trends like electronic trading, where you know, people who are old enough will probably remember. I don't remember. I've only read about it. And I've seen videos of people shouting in the uh, arena for buying and selling shares. But yeah, the open outcry system uh, going to electronic uh, shares becoming dematerialized. Uh, more and more IPOs coming in, acquisitions becoming more international for all these uh, entities, and asset classes becoming available. So you could have derivatives on top of derivatives now. So these kind of activities also uh, made these exchanges more important over a period of time. So uh, totally, this is basically a vertical evolution as well as horizontal evolution. So you could grow organically as transactions and participants increased. At the same time, you could create categories where people wouldn't have thought of investing or uh, trading in those categories before and made them accessible all over the world. So it became a fluid global market. And essentially, you because you control the plumbing, you control the pumping station, you could easily uh, provide liquidity available all over the world. Uh, one fantastic book. I mean, if you are really interested to read the history of uh, what happened. So this book captures a lot of the history of New York Stock Exchange. And this is a very, very uh, particular piece of history, which is very interesting to read because NYSC, I think is a hundred year old plus company. And uh, the exchange has been around for a very long time. Uh, and it is, it's a behemoth, right? I mean, it's owned by a listed company called Intercontinental Exchange. But at, at one given point, NYSC was 80% of the equity trading that happened in the US. Uh, and it's a large number. I mean, people might not think 80% is large because NSC probably has larger uh, uh, volume market share. Uh, but it's interesting to see that uh, NYSC at one point had the largest market share. In fact, they were spending billions of dollars in the 1980s to create technology infrastructure, which 
actually benefited them over the period of time but they were investing that kind of money in the 80s it's it's a billion dollars right i mean this is a large amount of money they were putting in creating network infrastructure creating the systems that uh, become popular afterwards but after but people always get dejected when uh, there is a the club is controlled by a few mem- few members and the members incentives then trump over the overall market size and growth so a lot of uh, traditional uh, sorry not a lot of unorthodox exchanges started coming up called dark pools or uh, people basically did not put any of their transaction data on nyse and started aggregating uh, trade information outside of the nyse as a regulatory push in terms of lobbying to break the power of nyse so that really worked and over a period of time you could see the 80% plus market share that nyse enjoyed uh, even as early as the ni- uh, early 90s is actually now somewhere close to about 23 24% and all these smaller burgeoning exchanges kept on growing and became uh, equally relevant as compared to nyse and this is a market evolution this is what happens when uh, you probably take a monopolistic attitude to an extent where you are unable to provide a competitive service which benefits everybody and you scale on basis of that so essentially uh, a lot of these other players who came in they uh, commoditized the service that nyse was providing in some extent and made sure that it's accessible to everyone rather than only one uh, member control group was able to run it and eventually nyse got merged with euronext and euronext and nyse combination went into ice and some of these acquisitions also are interesting uh, and if you look at the revenue streams right i mean all these exchanges have transaction as the largest part of their revenue stream but some of them also have uh, data that they provide for maybe for index services maybe for past transactional data maybe for traders who or arbitrageurs who want data about price volume they'll provide it uh, as a package and sell it to people and there are a large number of institutions and instances where data gets sold on a subscription basis or even on a per trade basis and these are kind of sources of revenue which never existed for them so providing technology access to the market providing the back end infrastructure providing the trading execution softwares uh, right from that to just allowing trading was a huge leap for some of these companies so they are more technology businesses now or te- than technology driven businesses as they were in the past and their their ability to even sell technology to other people or license it to other people is also uh, quite phenomenal but it's a fantastic book do do take some time if you are really interested about the history of capital markets and some of the evolutions of exchanges and how they became so dominant uh, all over the world another very very interesting trend that uh, of course we all know about this is a slide from uh, i think the latest uh, michael mobosin uh, paper which he published uh, a pretty interesting slide just to show the trend of uh, actively managed the cumulative flows into us active to passive funds and this is a trend from 08 till 2019 and of course the graph is indicative that more amount of money has flown into passive uh, asset managers uh, whereas active asset managers have lost a market share in terms of asset management and we clearly know some of them have become trillions of dollars in size in terms of passive funds and all of these essentially uh, provide uh, sorry all of these actually depend on something called as the index construction that is required so any index so for example we know some famous brands right like sensex which is a top 30 stocks or nifty 50 which is a top 50 stock or nifty 500 these are indices managed controlled by uh, the exchanges they essentially designed by them and they are also maintained and the calculations will be done by them to make sure that uh, the data is accurately captured uh, what stocks can be allowed to go in can not be allowed to go in actually is the uh, decision of the uh, person calculating that and you can also make it formula based and you can also have some discretionary metrics on top of that so uh, not only the ability to um, uh, make the index and keep the calculations running smoothly and accurately uh, you also have a responsibility of creating a brand out of it so not anybody who wakes up tomorrow can create an exchange and uh, sorry create an index and make it relevant all over the world so for example snp uh, 500 and dow jones that is a combination of two businesses one is snp uh, global which is the parent company of prisil and uh, dow jones indices which is a company owned by uh, the cme group which is chicago mercantile exchange uh, these two companies came together and made a joint venture to have this business running called snp dow jones uh, where they provide index services for and i think snp finder is one of the oldest uh, indices out there uh, and this this index is essentially is a brand now that brand can be used in multiple ways you can use it license it to create a product and which can attract money 
and that money can essentially be invested in the way the index is structured and whatever stocks come in and go you can basically rebalance the portfolio accordingly and you pay a index licensing fee to the index provider for that reason and the third and the most important thing is it provides you the uh, authority uh, to actually bend people's wills so there's an interesting company called the M uh, called MSCI it's a listed entity uh, again one of those companies with a negative net worth uh fantastic returns profile fantastic margins fantastic cash flows uh, they are not an exchange their only job is to make an index and if you look at msci annual reports and statements and if you just go back in time and just read how they have evolved it's a phenomenal uh, operating history of a company whose only job is to create an index and make sure that they provide that index with the authority that they can always say that yeah this is the index based on our rules and once it goes to a tipping point uh, of more number of people relying on that index So, for example, if you are a foreign investor, uh, investor from outside of India, wanting to invest in India, you would want to see which companies in India are part of the emerging market index, which MSCI creates. Uh, and recently, uh, Chinese companies have also been allowed to enter that index, which erstwhile they were not allowed to, because uh, there were some terms and conditions of MSCI which Chinese authorities were not allowing to, uh, were not relenting on. and once they relented actually look at the might you know you can bend the will of a country like china whose regulators can allow uh, exchanges to allow indices to be created with chinese companies in them and some concessions will be made by those companies in order to become part of those indices similar trend we can see right now is the esg index investing team where you can create a thematic portfolio of esg companies now the characteristics of uh, where they stand in the esg hierarchy is now measured by the index provider now is the index provider responsibility to make sure they do all the verification that this company meets the criteria for esg uh, investing index and now that you get a natural benchmark right this company suddenly become naturally benchmarked to the esg standards of all over the world and any investor who wants to have a esg exposure they can essentially buy that etf or index directly as a asset uh, manager or a investor in any etf so the rise of passive funds has been a very important uh, development in the past 10 years to 15 years of uh, not only the index providers but also exchanges who facilitate some of the trading of etfs on their platforms so how do they drive the data usage in financial data is that firstly you create the index then you uh, make sure the formula is applied and you license it out to people who want to use it to get their assets on their behalf essentially it's a rule and formula driven portfolio which uh, doesn't change that often so that is the whole sanctity of it whenever changes happen it's actually quite dramatic but uh, the, the portfolio remains the same in terms of the calculations and the uh, parameters with which companies are included in that list uh, this can also be around some sectors or thematic uh, indices like i mentioned esg is one of them uh, there can be there are like variety of uh, thematic uh, indices available out there in fact some from not so well known entities as well but some of the well known entities are known to everyone uh, you can essentially find a trend that is happening in the industry and create a theme around it uh, you market the theme and the theme itself becomes a ability to gather assets for those companies you can build a portfolio out of that theme it's essentially how a sector fund would be designed by an active manager but in this case uh, the rules are already published and everybody has to adhere to the rules if you want to invest in that theme and different asset managers can then license that product uh, essentially to create their own fund with that name uh of course a lot of people are now looking at uh, passive funds as a low cost alternative for diversifying into areas where they don't want to take an active risk or they don't want to rely on the fund manager's ability to pick and choose certain stocks so if some investors want to have a exposure to the us securities they might actually just buy the nasdaq etf if they want to or they can give money to an active manager who invests money into uh, uh, international stocks also like i said these some of the names are exclusive brands in themselves so this exclusivity and brand building goes hand in hand and it becomes stronger as more and more people uh, want to use that etf or want to use that index uh, to invest in that category so these are clearly uh, some trends which have helped index providers uh, some of the index providers are like i said completely unorthodox business entities which we otherwise wouldn't see in the traditional sense so i mean who would have thought that a index provider can become so large as an entity and important as an entity in the overall scheme of things for example msci uh, in its annual report lists blackrock as its largest customer and blackrock is one of the largest passive fund managers in the world uh, and blackrock essentially is about 10 to 11% of their top line and it is that kind of a customer and they rely heavily on msci's ability to maintain the sanctity of this index 
Now, why couldn't BlackRock do it themselves? Well, they can, and that's the challenge and the competitive uh, intensity in the market, where if you're an asset manager, create your own index and the own benchmark for uh, managing money, will that be accepted by investors or not? Will that be violating the mandates of pension funds or other institutional investors? That remains to be seen, but that's a, a burgeoning threat for this industry where large asset managers can then decide, okay, we don't want to go to this player. We will create our own uh, group of indices, which can probably be invested by us. But that does not happen at scale yet. So it's something we need to see if it happens in the future. Again, what I always uh, look at is data points. Right? I mean, uh, NSC publishes his annual report. You have uh, BAC publishing annual report. Other exchanges in India publish the annual report. Uh, and a lot of things are interesting. Sometimes they give the breakdowns of uh, all these categories and they do give segment information in the annual report. But uh, guess which is the largest or the fastest growing segment for NSC uh, in this year and the past year as well. And I mean, no guess because it came after that slide. Uh, it's the index services. It's about 25% growth in this year in index activity, but it's still a very small part of the overall scheme of things. But uh, NSC did find index services growing faster and deservedly so because uh, the brand of Nifty is quite popular and if it can be used to attract more money under management, because passive funds is not a great category in India right now, uh, not a large part of money is invested in passive funds, but it's changing. Slowly we are seeing uh, large uh, government bodies or even enterprises or even other investors, retail investors uh, investing in passive funds. And some of these categories and indices might actually be uh, very relevant and useful. But clearly, like I said, uh, so if you remember the slide of this sector consolidation into a few players, you will see that it's not been a straight line. It's actually been uh, winding stories and basically Murphy's law applies. I mean, if something can go wrong, it will in this kind of industry. And we are seeing business combinations which were forcing uh, exchanges to break up, forcing exchanges to basically sell parts of their lucrative businesses because they would become too powerful in that area. And uh, if they wanted to acquire something else and become even larger in some other area. So antitrust has been a very important part, uh, has been a very important part in the evolution of these companies. But I, I should give full points to all these companies to come up with very, very unique business combinations and sometimes even partnering with competitors uh, in order to get the strategic advantage in that market. Uh, again, you can see uh, freak market activity, people read about flash crashes, algorithms going wild. Uh, and that is again, a very interesting aspect of uh, this business where some of these are not tested. Some of these ideas are not fully tested. I mean, the risk parameters are known based on past activity. But if somebody does something new, somebody comes up with a new strategy, which is what the innovation in financial asset management is, and always people are trying to one up each other based on either technology, speed, analytics, or whatever. I mean, there is the information edge or an analytical edge or a behavioral edge. Either of these three edges can combine in a variety of ways to create activity in the market. And sometimes it can be a freak activity. Sometimes it can lead to glitches or flash crashes. Uh, the most important aspect for these exchanges as they become powerful is to maintain their integrity by creating a very highly secured network. I mean, how many times do we hear of uh, companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook getting hacked? I mean, we read about them in the media, but uh, like a pervasive system level hacks, uh, either they don't, don't get reported as often, but if they're happening, they're happening at levels which get mitigated immediately so that uh, the information is released. Even apps constantly have to keep updating themselves. In the same way, these technology providers also have to keep upgrading their infrastructure so that they can keep up with uh, the hackers and uh, people who are trying to get into the systems. I'm pretty sure, I mean, if you read the news data, the New Zealand exchange got hacked, I think just a month or two back and uh, the trading activity was completely halted. Uh, so it, it happens, it can happen, and it has happened in the past as well. So it's a very, very important thing for them to uh, put their foot down and say that okay, we will invest in technology to make sure we won't get hacked uh, and the uh, integrity of the markets won't be affected because of our lack of security. Now imagine if you are in a country where, uh, if you are in a cyber war with another country, everything is game, everything is fair. You either attack a power grid, you either attack a, a stock market infrastructure, you can attack anything. So all these are fair game for uh, a scenario like a war within countries. And the last but not the least is, like I said, antitrust is essentially out there to get them to eliminate conflicts of interest. But some of these conflicts of interest actually are very difficult to pinpoint also. There are gray areas where you might say that, okay, 
uh, why does this particular company get a reason get a chance to be in the index uh, and then benefit from the allocation that index providers will give that stock or a particular company and a lot of these things might be subjective there might be definitely objective rules around it but some of the subjectivity is also there which may not be revealed to us so conflicts of interest in index creation conflict of interest in benefiting certain companies to make them get into the index for some reason uh, bending the wills of governments to make sure that they will make concessions in their regulations to allow indices to function well with the companies of that geography and these are there some conflicts of interest we don't know how they are going to play out in the future but they clearly are conflicts of interest and we need to monitor them as we monitor any business risk for all these companies another fantastic book if you really want to understand uh, the flash crash that happened uh, i think few years back uh, I, i won't reveal anything it's 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 a amazing it's a fast book you can read it i think probably in a couple of days time uh, but it's worth reading to see uh, what the exchange did in terms of finding the perpetrator and i wouldn't give you the full context because it reveals the plot in the end if you haven't been following the story you may not know what it is and it's actually fun to read if you have not followed it but you can clearly see clearly see the uh, kind of a road map of decision making of exchanges and how they try to make sure that the integrity is maintained and the press is basically on their side nobody accuses the exchange of something and uh, then you can find one rogue errant trader who did something and it caused a flash, flash crash but in fact it's the whole system that caused it i mean if the system did not exist the trader wouldn't have done all those things that they that he could have so a fantastic book uh, i think rajiv also read it so he, he might have his own insights uh, and we can do that in the post q and a discussion all right so the second uh, another important aspect and i think these are i think the two other aspects are a little smaller as compared to exchanges because exchanges are something which are far more dominant and uh, widespread as compared to these but these are also equally important the rating aspect of the data providers where ratings is essentially i would say uh, a validation and justification as a service where either you are a company or a person and you want to engage in any financial activity and you want to get approved in some way for that activity uh, you need a some you need some label some justification somebody to vouch for you and say yeah this this person is okay this company is all right i mean please take the money please please give money to this person uh, and you can get a fair interest rate uh, if you are in a i mean if you if you have maintained all the financial parameters as per of course people have gamed it uh, it's not like people haven't gamed it uh, but yeah it's it's a validation as a service so if 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 you want to give money to someone but uh, you need a third party validation for giving money to somebody then you need a rating agency to tell you that uh, also their their job essentially is to find correlations in different data sets so there was a time when data sources that were tapped into to analyze uh, a decision can go bad or not uh, now more data points are available you can actually tap into market level data can tap into supply chain level data to find out whether it's going to be a problem for this company few years down the line few quarters down the line and we can actually correlate some of these past data sets to see that okay when this market situation happened this company cash flows behaved this way so maybe their rating downgrade can happen at this point in time and data is available uh, i wouldn't say the correlations are accurate uh, or the causations are accurate but data is available to correlate in whichever way you can and then you can justify that decision as well that yeah based on our past correlations we thought that the rating should downgrade or for example if uh, people were only looking at credit card payment information for a individual person uh, maybe they are now looking at telephone payment bill payment history the number of times person has changed his address the number of uh, movie tickets somebody has bought uh, and all sorts of data can be correlated and we can figure out okay if these three four things happen then this person is a good credit if these three four things don't happen then he's a bad credit and then you can allocate the credit score accordingly so the refinement in the data uh, so in the ratings that can happen by correlating different data sets is actually quite phenomenal and is possible to do now because of technology availability like i said behavior tracking is something you can do in human beings as well as uh, in companies uh, in human beings it has actually gone to intrusive levels where most of the banking apps anyway have access to our uh, smss and phone conversations in terms of the phone logs uh, and also location data so you can track exactly everything that has happened in a particular location so if you are standing next to a mall or in the location says you are in the mall and uh, the sms says that you spent on credit card to buy an ice cream then yeah you at this point in time you bought an ice cream the data point for the bank to analyze whether you are good credit or bad credit and they can basically do their own analysis on top of the credit score that you are getting all this basically is to uh, create accuracy in the predictions of course nobody can predict accurately but if you have 
uh, some sort of understanding of what has happened in the past and as granular as possible you don't know what correlations it might throw out so sometimes a machine can throw out certain combinations of correlations which you don't know were possible for a human to imagine and that can probably improve, increase accuracy of predictions at some point in time or also unfairly uh, you know derate somebody who otherwise was going to be good credit going ahead but in the past if you have seen most of these things were actual transaction oriented and they still are to some extent so you need uh, more borrowing you need more uh, papers to come out in terms of the credit fixed income market in order to be rated you, you need more people to borrow money at more frequency so that the ratings organic volume keeps growing so it has been a transaction oriented business and over a period of the past 30 40 years these have actually become global scale companies where uh they have local subsidiaries which are also dominant in that geography so we have crystal in india is actually the most dominant rating agency in our country you have standard and so you have moody subsidiary ikra is also dominant player number uh, formidable number two player and the same thing happens in all sorts of uh, geographies as well another interesting development for ratings has happened now is the chinese market has opened up for uh, review of their fixed income securities and their securities so that is another source of revenue which might come in albeit the volume of securities is so large that uh they may not be able to make the same amount of money but the systems have already been designed the investment has already happened all they have to do is implement and apply and let's see how that uh, next stage of growth for these companies grow go uh, in a different market which they have not operated at the same scale yet but the whole job has to uh, basically like i said co- find data sources disparate data sources and combine them into a cohesive report or generate ability and it, it's much more like the job for the matrix operator right in the movie where you could see all sorts of details happening and then come up with a decision and then recommend something to people who are actually in the matrix so people the financial uh, data users are in the matrix we are actually executing trades and making decisions of financial uh, importance to us and data can be provided from various sources so now as they were doing that job anyway they were data providers by design as well so they were internally curating these sources for themselves uh, at one point in time most of them decided that yeah let's put this as a uh, user uh, interface and let people tap into this and you can have different segmentation and i mean if if you go to these websites and see if you can actually subscribe to a service you will not find the pricing data anywhere you will find very very vague management sounding words uh, which are mentioned there uh, and essentially you will have information inside but it there is a way to ask for more money from you so you have to negotiate very hard in order to uh, get access to the information that they have and some of the natural extension of services was to provide company financial data anyway the models are built by them for their analysts to rate and review these models can be found in one place and they can be given as a database to you so in india we have used ace analyzer or capital line or even screener.in or money control as data financial data providers now but at any point in time if you want to go back 20 years the data will be always compiled by these people and they can provide an excel sheet to you if you ever demanded it so they interestingly also have public database and private database as well so we may have listed companies in the range of uh, i think 4 to 5000 but private database might be much larger uh, where companies of even smaller sizes to mid size to large size not listed yet their data will be available to use by users again corporate filings can be mapped and kept in one place uh, nowadays you can find con call transcripts and everything very easily at one point in time they were not available uh, you had to actually go to the company if they had if you're lucky they would have recorded the audio then they might send you the audio reluctantly in fact it was not a mandatory data point to use but now as investor relations has become a booming industry that has become a requirement for everyone and they are curating this as well uh, we can also like i said integrate data from different sources like supply chain data can be put in over there and provide a lot of operating metrics for uh, data users in the context that they require so somebody might require a supply chain analysis of a company they are tracking and they might be able to tap into a service that is already capturing that internally but pay an additional subscription to be part of that uh, access that is provided to them uh, again we can we, we have seen multi class multi asset class services so you can track commodities you can track equities fixed income uh, interest rates everything to this uh, data providers and you can also track index you can get index services from it so spgi which is the parent company of crystal uh, snp global incorporated that company provides snp uh, 500 and dow jones along with cme group so the index services also have become a important part of that business of course you can create analytics business on top of that do some fancy machine learning and you know sell it as a 
analytics portfolio, you can also uh, get data from the customers and say that we will analyze it for you based on our proprietary algorithms. Uh, and you can become a consultant of sorts uh, to many of the providers. Of course, these are the these are things that even some of the uh, big four audit firms also provide now in terms of management consulting and business consulting, strategic consulting. But these companies are having the tools which they use internally as well. And they have a better reputation, I would say, to provide data to people. Uh, essentially, they act like a flashlight in a dark room. Uh, and I would like to give an example of a company which SNP uh, Group acquired called Panjiva. It essentially tracks supply chains all over the world by tracking the government port data that happens. So any import export activity that happens on all ports gets mapped into some ministry of uh, economic activity is mapped over there. And that data is downloaded by these guys and analyzed. And then you have all these uh, financial data that comes from their banking relations or the corporates who are uh, basically getting rated by them will also provide this information that yeah look at this data of the bill of lading or whatever uh, that we that it shows that we have sold this inventory to somebody and it's going there and that's why we need to raise money and that's why you should rate us so all this data can get combined into one single source uh, so you use your ratings databases you use, use your panjiva led databases from government data and you create this kind of a flashlight in the dark room for most companies uh, and use this kind of a jargon saying that leverage our data research and visualization tools to better understand how to quantify your exposure to supply, suppliers. And this is, this is sold to corporates. This is a particular screen which is sold to corporates. Anybody can use this, Any, uh, even a mutual fund investor, uh, fund manager can also use the data to see if the companies they are tracking are actually doing supply chain, uh, are actually visible to supply chain to verify some of the claims that the company makes. But yeah, I mean, uh, figure out logistics sector, how it is responding to the coronavirus, uh, how is the export restrictions affected you or your sector, and what sense of recovery can you anticipate? And this is essentially a prediction kind of a business. It's a crystal ball uh, in digital world, I would say. But I don't know, to make it more uh, palatable, I would say it's a flashlight in the dark room where people know that the room's confines and the walls exist, but we don't know where they are. So we just want to put a light in that area and see what is happening. But it's, a, I think, a valuable business service that they are providing uh, for a fee. And it has made more than 50% of the revenue for these companies now comes from data services and not rating. And these are subscription-based with very sticky customers with 90% plus retention rates, whereas a transaction business has now become less than 50%. It's close to 40% for uh, S&P, and it's close to about 35 34% for uh, Moody's. Uh, now, if you can see that, uh, you realize that uh, this business is actually growing much faster than the uh, transactional business as well. And, and mind you, the transactional business also grows because capital markets keep growing larger and larger as new companies access the market. Of course, if you have seen the movie Big Short, you know the role. And this, if you haven't seen the movie, probably once you tune out of the presentation, go on Netflix and watch it. Uh, for those who have watched it, you can watch it again. It's an enjoyable movie. And the book is also even more interesting if somebody wants to deep dive. But this shows the pervasive nature of how the ratings industry was responsible to some extent uh, for creating some of the products that were available at that time. And we also saw that how the abuse of ratings can actually lead to the toppling of the entire rating structure and the products, financial products based on those ratings. And uh, of course, anybody wants to buy the kit, it's available in the memorabilia shop for the big shot. I actually wanted to buy it, but it's very expensive. So. Anyway, I just showed it here. If somebody buys it for me as a gift, I would take it. So, so really, I mean, we know that there are tailwinds for this company, but there are also very, very serious headwinds. It's not something that is going to be a straight line, just like we saw in exchanges context. And we know that sometimes when it works, it works really well, but when it doesn't work, it actually is pretty bad. It's very nasty in terms of what the market impact can be. And some of the things we may not even anticipate that they might scale up to that level because these are now global entities can rate a lot of papers, which otherwise uh, we will not be able to track individually. So for example, ratings fraud is a serious concern where people might be paying for ratings we don't know of. Uh, there might be willful blindness in areas where the rating agency should have paid attention, but did not pay attention to the extent that it deserved. Or deliberately turned a blind eye because it was convenient for them to earn fees or whatever. And this has been displayed. I mean, there have been fines and settlements that SNP has paid, even Moody's have paid uh, for settling with the uh, various states in the United States or even the central government, uh, basically denying any involvement. At the same time, to end the lawsuit, they just paid a settlement, a fine, which 
in the overall scheme of things is not a very meaningful fine to pay and we would never know what happened underneath uh, to uncover that particular thing also a certain amount of filter bubble happens when you are rating something and you only look at the same data again and again you essentially start believing that this is the evidence and this is it in terms of so what you see is all there is is something that happens all the time and investors who rely on this information actually might turn a blind eye to the same things that the rating agency has turned a blind eye to and the biases will be copied right to the decision makers as well and like i said these are the justification as a service right you are just buying a justification from somebody uh, and you're not the person who's paid for the rating you're just using that rating to justify your decision making so that you won't lose your job if somebody gets hurt you will always say oh it was a triple a rated company and i gave money to them and no it did not it wasn't triple a so a lot of the things lead to uh, blind spots for investors as well if they rely blindly on uh, ratings information but most sophisticated investors and professional investors don't do that they do duplicate a lot of effort that the rating agency do put in and they create their own sources of data they have their own sources of information analysis and then they will compare their analysis with the rating analyst to come to some cohesive conclusion but yeah duplication of effort is i think required in my understanding that uh, any person who is giving money should know their own uh, way around the security as much as the rating agency or even more than the rating agency because it's their skin in the game and not the rating agency and of course if you see the acquisition history of these companies over the past 20 years they have been adept at acquiring smaller companies which are uh, niche data collectors in certain area and sometimes you will be amazed at why why would they buy a company which has a mobile tracking app but now you know why i mean now we live in a post mobile world where everybody has a mobile phone a smartphone to that extent with apps installed on it you can actually track uh, far more sophisticated data and correlate that with something of course anonymized we assume Uh, but you can track it more sophisticated manner to come up with better uh, predictions so clearly it's not a straight line for these people as well uh, to get a context i mean this book is a little philosophical about the idea of willful blindness but to get a context of what happens or what could happen in a large corporate where you have thousands of employees spread all over the world and decisions are not made uh, from a central authority at some of these segments the willful blindness can creep up in ways which can lead to blow ups and we have seen those blow ups but a fantastic book to read if you want to go into a philosophical aspect of how this happens and even to us even we can sometimes willfully blind ourselves to certain data points uh, which actually might be the right data points to look at at that particular point in time last and another interesting piece of this puzzle i would not say the puzzle but the three legged stool of uh, financial data as a service is the aggregators and uh, and all this thing in common for all these things is the massive amount of keys this guy generate uh, so whenever we have seen any financial film or a film depicting a finance kind of a situation we have seen these uh, terminals around the characters you know in the uh, wall street uh, in the 80s and in the big shot or even billions if you guys are fans i mean now with the high resolution kind of a shows like these with hd you can actually see what is even written on the screen so i mean if you go into details you will know that actually it's a pretty relevant screen for a person who's a fund manager to see at a particular time it was designed uh, the, the shows show runners have actually designed the particular display to look like it's legitimate display which a fund manager would see and these are the terminals that we are seeing all the time right i mean this is something which uh, finance gets associated in the popular media the, the black and yellow and glittering lights and green and red flashing all over the place that's how people who do who are not in finance associate finance with or we want to see it that way so that it to the legitimacy of finance so if you uh, one thing if you want to see the size of this industry and what is the appetite of some players now the london stock exchange group announced an acquisition of a company called refinitiv which is still in the works because of regulatory entanglements now refinitiv is twice the size of uh, lse group and have a lot a lot of overlapping in terms of trading activity as well but definitive uh, has, has thomson reuters inside which actually is a database provider and i showed you the circle in the beginning where lsc becomes a trading venue for generating multi asset data and definitive becomes the analysis and data gathering part which provides information decision making material to data users so it's a fairly interesting acquisition we know the purpose now of why this acquisition makes sense Uh, but the appetites are actually massive when companies can raise money and uh, commit so much capital to do to these kind of deals and also regulatory capital you are actually relinquishing some of your prized possessions in the past where you had the highest market share in some business but you have to relinquish that in order to provide uh, the, the space for definitive to be fit into it without 
uh, raising any antitrust alarms. And if you just see the market size, I mean, I was amazed when I actually found the numbers. So Bloomberg is not listed. So these are estimates. But the rough estimate of 2020 was that Bloomberg is a $10 billion revenue company, which is phenomenally large for a company that sells terminals. Uh, most individual users may not even use them ever in their life. Uh, but most financial institutions at least have one terminal uh, with them. Uh, so Bloomberg, yeah, it's a $10 billion company. Uh, Refinitiv, which is like, so if you convert to dollars, it was $6 billion, close to $6 billion is an annual run rate. They also have a, a trading venue as well as the data business, but data business is a larger part of their business. And FactSet, another important uh, data service provider uh, with company information uh, is another distant third player in this market. Of these, among these three of them, Refinitiv will be having a quarter of the market share. Bloomberg will have another 30% market share. FactSet will have some smaller market share and other players, there's a list of large number of players who provide disparate data uh, for people to consume. So yeah, it's a fairly large industry and uh, the run rate of this rate and even growing terminals, uh, terminal installations year over year and retaining the past terminals because these are becoming furniture in people's uh, offices, right? I mean, nobody will imagine not working with a Bloomberg if they are embedded completely in the workflow of Bloomberg. They may really have to uproot each and every process and unbundle it in a very painful manner. So that is what leads to, uh, in this industry, the Bloomberg Envy where Bloomberg has successfully bundled a lot of lucrative services into one. And of course, Refinitiv as well, uh, Factored as well. And now, uh, because the data has been democratized to such a large extent, providers are willing to create tiered uh, plans for your individual users to use, or even a small group of users to use, or create APIs so that if you are a software developer in this space, a data aggregator space, you can actually tap into the pre-built APIs and you can create your own dashboards with that data that you're getting from these players. So you're getting a Bloomberg-like service, but actually a bloomberg light service. It's not at the cost of Bloomberg, but you'll get a similar kind of power in terms of what data you're able to access. Uh, of course, you can combine different sources and create a more simplified user interface. So if you've seen Ace Equity Capital and in the past, it's actually dense and complex, but uh, websites like Ticker or Coifin or even RateStar, Trendline, RateStar is again made by Ace Analyzer Group only. Uh, Trendline is an independent player. Screener is again an independent player. And they created their own interfaces and there are huge fan following for these interfaces now. Nobody wants to like, move out of these. And that's why these become more and more useful over a period of time. Another important piece that is getting unbundled and has been unbundled for a while for larger institutions is the order management systems and the uh, trade execution systems. Uh, so if you have a, a trade management system as part of Bloomberg, then you everybody in the trading uh, supply chain in the company needs to have that uh, Bloomberg access. Uh, but most companies don't want to buy such expensive terminals. So one terminal costs about $25,000 uh, per year. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you can get these services as well. Uh, now, unbundling has been happening for a long time. It's not something new. Again, portfolio tracking analytics becomes very easy because they are linked to all the company data in the past and you can you know, get live analytics and dashboards, which saves a lot of time for a fund manager to look at data immediately and make decisions on the fly. So essentially reducing the time, providing the convenience of everything big in terminal and then the, and charging the $24,000 uh, label for a customer. So what is now happening is to separate all these specialized services into going into special, specialists in that area who provide one part of the data, but because of the technology that they're using, the deployment has become cheaper. Uh, so they can sell it at a cheaper price point. So from specialized services, which are, which are actually more preferred now than the bundled mediocrity of some of these uh, larger platforms. And of course, you know, who, who wouldn't prefer a cheaper uh, access to all the database that you can? It creates headaches because now you have different systems and different logins to manage, but yeah, it's cheaper. Uh, money really works uh, as a good incentive to do all these things. And in this presentation, I willfully ignored uh, an interesting sector, which is actually facing one of its existential challenges, I would say is the payment processing industry whose transaction data streams are the largest in the world. Uh, every single credit card swipe or online credit card usage or debit card usage goes through these systems. These are feats of engineering. It's amazing how they operate and stay up all the time uh, and plug in all the infrastructure together. You can actually spend money in Europe right now on your credit card and it will all be processed properly and everything will be sorted in a moment's time for you as a user, the order will be fulfilled. Uh, but on the back end, they might take a couple of days, different merchant fees and all sorts of regulatory infrastructure has to be stepped over to make these things work. 
of course the best thing that they could do was behavior prediction services but i don't think they provided in the service maybe i'm not aware uh, again it essentially provides a map of the capacity to borrow of a person uh, in this financial journey and that gives you the data data points that a credit score company might require a lender might require and these are something that they can provide very easily what is happening now is the peer to peer payment uh, movement all over the world so china has moved on to peer to peer india is moving because of upi quite rapidly i would say everybody nowadays uses upi i'm just amazed even a vegetable vendor on the street can now have a qr code uh, printed and kept in between the vegetable tokery somewhere and you can scan it when you buy vegetables it's amazing so this is actually the fintech uh, disruption of these industries and this is something i would i'm keenly watching as to see what happens to the collective 40 billion dollar revenue of payment processing gateways all over the world all right in conclusion let's say long live data and what is uh, now more interesting to track after this is data generation capacity right everything that i'm saying right now will go on youtube on our channel and youtube's algorithms will basically do natural language processing uh, uh, script on that and they will piece it together as keywords so if anybody searches for uh, financial data as a service this presentation will pop up in all the search results if they are looking at something relevant so imagine happening happening automate uh, happening uh, sorry everything happening at a automated level where no human is required to actually connect all these dots the machines will know what exactly to connect because natural languages are processed now at real time speeds uh, data tracking also improves because more data becomes available you can see now the indian government is creating dashboards for tracking data of various sectors and industries so you can go to the ministry's website say go to a cashier page 5 years ago and go to the same page today you will see a lot of different data uh, which is available on the ministry's website as well although it's difficult to find but yeah it's there the new data comes up in uh, more and more representative ways and bundles i mean amazing the kind of bundles that are being created now so i mean this bundling unbundling keeps happening across the time and now now because we have so many disparate services somebody might come up and say okay i will give you these four five services together in one bundle which is still bloomberg lite but bloomberg like and you will get access to the data that you need uh, one thing which i really want to study in detail is the clear separation between the data provider and the customer because like i said uh, the index providers are becoming so dominant asset managers may not have enough say as to what they can or cannot do so maybe the asset managers and uh, other data users might come up with their own tools to compete with the data providers so the customer data provider uh, frenemy ecosystem is something i'm really interested to track and of course the ground keeps shifting because there's so much mna activity and so many things uh, keep revolving in this sector uh, it's interesting to track so if i imagine what a lsc group might look like 5 years from now i won't be accurate at all because things can change dramatically and they need them they might have to sell something they might have to uh, kill a particular activity to uh, digest a bigger acquisition and something like that so the ground keeps shifting so it's a completely dynamic industry it's amazing to track this and that leads me to some of the sources that i used which i think if you want to dig deeper can definitely find it useful uh, something i found enormously useful is the richness of the company filings it's amazing the uh, transcripts and everything is available for a long period of time for some of these companies you can track them and you can read about the history and the evolution some research papers are available on ssr and taylor francis Uh, mark rubinstein's substack was really important because he consolidates this in a far better way and a lucid manner than i can do in this presentation of course the regulatory actions uh, which you can track in public filings these are available and etf market trends these are data which is publicly available anybody can go through it and see what's been happening there all right that's the end of the presentation and i would love to take some questions now i will just make raj the host again you are the host now so i'll just uh, take uh, questions which have come uh, uh, in the q and a tab so one first question is from mr ramesh modi uh, how trust trustworthy is the financial data though they may be audited so we had the case of ial and fs in india so again uh, accounting shenanigans continue to happen and it's never going to be completely foolproof the discretion and the decision making has to be applied by the uh, end investor who is going to participate in these companies as a investment uh, that they are going to make so clearly it's not fully reliable some in some areas it will be very reliable where a company has a good track record of maintaining data points and making sure that investors are aware of what's happening in the company and they are also upfront about how the business activities are 
but if you choose to hide something and if you are savvy at hiding it you will be able to get away with it for a while a uh, second question is from mr kirit modi so can you uh, list out various listed entities under financial data providers or financial intermediaries in india in india you have uh, the obvious crystal and ikra and care who provide data and transaction data services uh, you have uh, the exchanges uh, right now you only have bsc is listed mcx is listed ies is listed although it's important to note that these are much smaller entities and much less complicated entities as compared to what their counterparts are globally so not all of them will be data providers at the scale and the scope that we saw other providers are but uh, yeah these are emerging categories and something you can keep tracking and i am most interested in tracking the evolution of this market in india anyone else who has a question can raise your hand or unmute yourself and directly ask the question either the presentation was very easy to understand or very complicated that no questions are coming up but yeah this is a fluid topic and i'm going to be tracking this data points very closely so we can always discuss this when we meet or interact afterwards uh, cool so there are no further questions i think i will end the recording at least and we can then chat amongst ourselves okay, there is in chat somebody asked a question raj uh, okay uh, in the chat there is a question uh, will data storage be a big business it already is so uh, i mean data storage when it, it comes to the technology realm now where uh, cloud computing providers are actually becoming the data providers for many of these entities and a uh, lot of these exchanges also so regulatory requirements will allow you to use cloud public cloud to store data of transactions and everything else so they are also data centers of their own so they will probably recruit some other technology system integrators and build data centers of their own and manage their own infrastructure themselves whereas some of the user facing interfaces can be created using the public cloud and uh, data is actually uh, stored across the public cloud as well as the private cloud in, in the way that it can be regulatory allowed to access at the same time data breaches can be avoided so it's a very large business and cloud computing providers are uh, largest technology providers for financial services companies i think that ends the q and a session we can have a free conversation now when our things got rough i always remember what my father used to say running a business Just as to man, my son, there are ups and downs, glorious highs, and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated. The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes, but when the chips are down, we must stand up, dust ourselves off, and motor on. Volatility. It's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, "There are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way." At PPFS. If you think like Rahul and his father, that volatility is a fact of running a business, and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term. PPFS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. read all scheme related documents carefully mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully